Well, my name is Connie Main Duarte, and I am from Portugal. But you can hear by my, my voice, and you can see by my coloring, that I am not Portuguese. I am by nationality now, but I am actually from Canada. And I moved to Portugal 18 years ago. And I went to Portugal originally to work with international university students. And while I was there, I was recruited by IFES and started working with the national movement. That led me to work in a, in a biblical seminary, which I did for three years, which then led me to join a small church, or a medium-sized church, I guess we would say, for Portuguese standards. It was the Baptist Church of Estoril, which is a, it's a town just outside of Lisbon. And it had about 80 members. And my husband and I had been, had been um, searching for a church for quite some time. The church that we had belonged to had shifted hands, as sometimes happens in Portugal, and it went in a, in a direction that we found frightening, so, so we ended up going on a church hunt. And it took us many, many months, and I, I could, that could be an entire seminar all on its own, is how to find a church and the difficulties that it can be for people to find a local church. But we stumbled upon this church uh, in Estoril, and, and right from the get-go, we thought, this is an amazing church. 80 people, so it was a good size for us. They, they had all of the ranges in ages, right from babies to a, a lady in our church who was 89 years old, and she brought her 90-year-old friend. I mean, it just had all the age gaps. There were Portuguese and there were Brazilians. We had a couple of Africans. So for me, the church really represented what, the, what, what a church should be. And, and, and when we walked in, we were immediately greeted. We were shown where to go. We were explained Sunday school for our kids. I mean, the whole package was really good. And immediately, we felt comfortable. And so we got home after this, this long kind of two-month search. And, and we said, well, what do, you, what do we do? Do we, do we keep looking around? Or do we say, look, let's just commit to this church? And, and we decided that we would commit to this church. So week after week, we attended this church. And we were more and more delighted, really, to feel part of a community, a caring group of people. Not that we all had everything in common, but we had what was important in common. We then made a very foolish mistake, which I see now was likely God-ordained, but I would never recommend this for anyone. Within the first three months, we accepted leadership positions. Now, I am not, this is, that's a different seminar as well, <laughs> but that's what we did. Again, today I would tell you that God blinded my common sense and allowed us to do that. So that put my husband and I in a position to work, obviously, with the leadership, uh, particularly with the pastor. Not long after that, the pastor announced that he was moving to get his PhD, and he was going to assign a co one of the co-pastors to take his place. The whole church applauded. We thought, we know this young man, this will be a great move. He talked to my husband and I, and he asked, would we continue on as leaders in the church? And we said yes. This was in November. In December, we went from 80 people to 14. How it happened is even in my mind, six years later, difficult to explain to you. I call it simply the pastor disaster. He was not who he said he was. He started manipulating the people, talking, having backward, backdoor conversations. Anyway, the whole thing exploded. And one after another, after another, after another, people left the church. And I remember looking at my husband at that time and saying, João, I told you. I told you. Because before we had found this church, we had really struggled with church. Now, that is a terrible thing to admit from a missionary, <laughs> that I struggled with church. But I really, really did. In Canada, I had a fairly healthy church, a normal, a normal church, but it never really feel, felt like a community. It was an event. It was something that I did on Sundays, and at that time, Sunday evenings, and Wednesday night prayer meetings, and the youth group. I mean, we had all this stuff, and I went because that's what you do. But I didn't feel it was particularly caring. When I moved to Portugal, it was a whole different cultural ballgame for me, and so learning what church meant in the Portuguese context was difficult. But we ended up joining a church that didn't feel like church either. And so we get to this point, and I looked at Joao and I said, what's the point of church? 
I mean, if this is what church is, what are we doing? And I think it's time to bail <laughs> and get out of here. And he said, we can't do that, Connie. Let's, let's be reasonable. We're not talking about an entity. We're not talking about an organization. We're talking about, and then he listed the members of the church. He said, you might be able to walk away from that building, but Connie, can you walk away from this person and this person and this person? And I knew he was right. So we sat in the service when the, when the pastor actually walked out the door and the elders got up and they said, well, now the pastor is gone. And so Connie, you being the second in command, you're in charge of the church. And I looked and I went, are you mad? I can't take care of this church. I mean, I had a different job. <laughs> but again, I realized the importance of taking care of this group of people and taking care of myself, I also needed to be taken care of after this disaster. After a few months, we were able to find a different pastor who was able to come in and start putting together the pieces. Not long after that, I actually joined and was ordained as pastoral staff. And we started thinking then about this Baptist Church in Eshterdil. What do we do with this? Here we have a group of 14 people who have been battered and bruised by leadership. How do we heal? And in the course of our praying together over how do we heal and how do we put this back together, we thought we don't have to. We don't really want to. Instead, we decided not to, not to put this, this Baptist church back to the way it was. We thought this is a golden opportunity to do something different with the same group of people. Now with 14 people, you can do that. And especially 14 people who just had a rotten experience. It's very easy to change the idea of church and the concept of church when people have been hurt and when you're only 14. It doesn't take much convincing. And so the first thing we did was change the name from the Baptist Church in Estoril to Meeting Point. Because we said, we want to create a place where people come together wherever they're at on the journey and they meet together here knowing that they can walk wherever they need to go with the next person. There they can meet God. There they'll meet other believers. There they'll meet people who will simply walk with them. So that's where Meeting Point was born. But that was just the beginning. What was most pressing on my head and on my heart was, how do we now create something that looks a lot more like what I'm reading in the New Testament? Because when I started thinking about church, the first thing I did, because I'm not a church planter, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pastoral major, how do we plant a church or replant a church? So I went to the book of Acts. And I want to go through this part rather quickly because I know that you guys all know this stuff. But when I went to the book of Acts, I read through the whole book, but what really caught my attention were the first five chapters, specifically the first three chapters. Because what I was hunting for is what did the first churches look like? What happened when the Holy Spirit was let loose to do in people's lives whatever he wanted to do and however they would let him? So here are some of the things that I came upon. <laughs> First thing, they were, all these communities were notable for their sharing, for eating together. In fact, they were always together, Acts says. They were praying together. They were they, their meetings surrounded the study of scripture, listening to, and, to preaching and teaching. They were meeting the needs of everyone. There was a massive outpouring of generosity. It was spirit-driven, or if it wasn't spirit-driven, it was quickly found out, as we see from Ananias and Sapphira. As I read that, I got more and more excited of, could this happen? And then I had kind of another light bulb experience that said, you know, that really is fantastic to read. As long as we read the book of Acts the way it was intended to be written. It was a letter to Theophilus to say, this is what happened. Not this is the way it's going to happen in the future or the way it should happen in all times and all places. Our problem is, okay, my problem is, I really like to slap a model on something because models are easy. Models, I can say, if you put A, B, and C together, you should get D, E, and F. But real life doesn't work that way. But this, for me, was an inspiration. So instead of um, 
instead of fighting with acts and saying, I must recreate this or allow the Holy Spirit to recreate this, I need to rejoice with it. And I need to take and learn to, to understand when the Holy Spirit is actually working in the body and life of a community, there are certain things that need to happen. And one of those things, obviously, is the word community. It's not just a group of people who deal with an event. It's a group of people who actually strive to be together. So what are healthy communities? What do they look like? Where do they start from? Is this something that God invented? And I say, no, God did not invent community. God is community. This is the most fascinating thing for me. When we think about our concept, as limited as it is on the Trinity, you see the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit living in perfect community. So all three coexist. There's no jealousy. There's no usurping of, of position. There is humility to each other. And it's all bound together in love. And so when God, Trinity, in Genesis, creates man and then woman, I think what he was trying to do is, is, is show this most incredible experience that he has in eternity to us. Look at what this looks like when you can look and be together, different, the same, diverse, but unified. And Adam and Eve, and we don't really know how long they had, but they were able to experience that. Before the fall, we have the Trinity walking around, hanging out with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve looked at each other, and not only did they go, whoa, <laughs> that looks good, but they also went, whoa, that looks the same. Adam was seeing animals pairing up, and when he looked around, he didn't find anything that looked like him. So when we see Eve, it wasn't that he just had a sexual response to her to say, whoa, aren't you different? Look what we can do together. He looked at her and said, whoa, we're the same. We can communicate because we both have two ears and a mouth and eyes and they're all in the same position and they had unity in their diversity. And they had communication that was free and easy between, between themselves and also with God. And then we have the fall. And all of a sudden, that structure, the only community that, that continued to exist in its beautiful form was a trinity. Everything else was, was ripped apart. Man and woman looked at each other and said, yeah, we're the same, and your differences are annoying. And we looked at God and said, I'm not quite sure that you're giving me all that I deserve. So there was a break in community between God and man, man and woman, and yet, again, when we look back at the, at the book of Acts, even in this state, there is hope. And that's the whole redemption story, isn't it? That when Christ died and was resurrected, we got a second chance. It's not gonna be a perfect second chance until Christ comes again, but we're moving closer, and we can be working on this to get into the type of community that once again, doesn't represent just the, the male-female relationship, but actually starts to look a lot more like what the Trinity has been teaching us all the time. In order to have a community, you have to have a center. In fact, the word community has its root in the word common. So when we say community, we're saying something that draws a group of people to a common center. And you can list hundreds of communities that all of us have. You are Bulgarian, so you belong to the Bulgarian community. I'm Canadian, Portuguese, I belong to those two communities. But then we, are, we're, we have our sports clubs, and we have our family groups, and we have our church environment, and we have our political. All of these things, including our neighborhoods, are small communities, something that gathers us together for a common purpose or a common location. In order to be a healthy community as the body of Christ, what has to be in the center? Christ. The only way a healthy Christian community is ever going to survive is if Jesus Christ is in the center. Now that, that sounds lovely, <laughs> and it sounds right, and it is lovely, and it is right, but it's not easy. 
because everything in our society says take him out and put something else in. And this is a constant threat that every single community, every single body of Christ needs to fight with if they're going to stay healthy communities. But if we go to Ephesians chapter 4, 11 to 16, you guys can open it. I'm not going to read it for us, but please read as I talk. You'll see that when we have a Christ-centered community, it's Jesus who's the one who unites us. Be careful if the reason why your church exists or if your, if your organization exists because of a charismatic leader. If that's the center of your community, it's not going to last very long and there's going to be damage. It's got to be Jesus who gives us, an, uh, who, who gives us our purpose, our reason, our common goal, and it's him who unites us by giving us a purpose. Now, we're going to see this a little bit more clearly a little bit later on, but in this generation, purposes are becoming more and more important because nobody has one. And that remains one of the number one questions that I hear, at least from youth in Portugal, is why am I here? Why am I studying? What's, what's the reason for all of this? I mean, if you know anything about Portugal, our economy is, is still really bad. And so we're having university graduates going to the unemployment line right out of university. So they're saying, what's the purpose? Well, Jesus gives us a purpose. He gives the church a purpose. He gives us a chance to belong to something bigger than ourselves. He gives us meaning, something that is real and tangible something that people can see, that they can feel, that they can experience. He also gives a mission. And that mission, according to the book of Ephesians, is actually twofold. It's internal and it's external. So when you read Ephesians 4, 11 to 16, the internal reason, the internal mission that we have is so that we all grow together in unity to reach Christ. It's not the leader who's supposed to reach Christ first and drag his or her congregation or organization behind them. The idea, the internal mission that we have is that we are so well trained, so well taught, so much using our gifts together that we all reach maturity in Christ together. That's our internal mission. And then we have an external mission, and that is we've got to get it out there. This isn't supposed to just stay here. It's got to go out into the world because it's in the world that the church is seen and known and makes a difference. So he gives us a purpose, he gives us a mission, and then he gives us the capacity to complete that mission. Imagine if he had just given us a purpose and a mission and then said, well, you're kind of on your own. We would be lost because it's a massive mission, both internally and externally. So he's given us the, the, the means to get it done, and that is with our spiritual gifts. Our spiritual gifts are incredibly important within the body of Christ. But too many of us, again, have this mentality of when we talk about community, when we talk about church, it's actually a building. Most of us get an image of our church building. And we think, yes, when I'm in my church, I use my gifts. But we almost always end meeting point services by saying, now the service is over, meeting point is leaving the building. So the church is leaving the building. When you have that mentality, it says that the gifts that we've been given are not just useful in four walls. When the church leaves the building, the gifts still need to function. That's how we're going to complete our mission. But even then, we're severely limited. And so Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit, which packs the punch, which gives us the drive, which gives us the boldness, which gives us the reason and the purpose and the whole passion to do what we do. But again, it's pretty easy to replace that center, including the fact that some communities replace Jesus as the center. The community becomes so important to itself that Jesus kind of gets off so that they can do their thing. And if you don't believe me, all you have to do is open up to Revelation chapter 3. The church of Sardis was the biggest church in Asia Minor. It was the most powerful church. It was the richest church. It was the only church out of the seven that did not face persecution. And what did Jesus say about it? You are dead. It is possible to have church, to have community without Jesus being in the center. We have it in Sardis. 
We see him, we see Jesus slipping out of the center in Ephesians. You've lost your first love. Jesus is being pushed to the side. Theology was being put in the middle. We see him slipping out of the other churches as well, except for Philadelphia and, and, um, and Smyrna, all in different areas. It's very easy to replace Jesus with tolerance, with acceptability, with anything but love, with community itself. So if those aren't challenges enough to keep a community alive, what are other challenges and even dangers of community living? Let's look first at challenges. What are the challenges of trying to restart Meeting Point and living as community in 2016? We started 2009, but now we're in 2016. We're still doing the work on getting this built and passed on and, and to leave our doors. So what are, we, what are we finding? What are these challenges? The first challenge that we see is a lack of roots. Most of us have moved around a lot in our lives. Is there anyone here that's living in the same place where you were born? More than normal. Most of us have moved around, by the, by the age that I am, I'm 45, most of us have moved around about 10 times. So if you have a congregation of people moving in and out of your city, moving in and out of your church, they don't understand what, what roots are. There once was a time when you could guarantee that your church was made up of people from that neighborhood. And it was there from, from, their, from the kids, from their grandparents or their parents. It was a community church. Nobody left. Nobody moved. That was your group. Not today. People don't have roots. Broken families, changing mums and dads, leave families and kids without the feeling of roots and solidity and something to hold on to. Job changes. My dad worked for the same company for 40 years. My generation is said to change jobs every five to seven years. Today, career changers say that you will actually change your career, not your job, you will change your career approximately five to seven times during your working life. So about a third of the total workforce will now change their jobs every 12 months. That's a lot of change. That's, that's not allowing anyone to feel. Now if that's happening in the world, imagine you're getting those same people coming into your church and you're trying to build community. <laughs> You're trying to get them rooted in, and that's a concept they don't even know. We aren't from the same town. I don't have the same parents. I have about four or five of them. I changed jobs, or my parents changed jobs. And now you're talking about what are roots? What does that even mean? That's a huge challenge. Changing churches. Lots of us have changed churches lots of different times for lots of different reasons. <coughs> We hear it all the time. I don't like that church. The music didn't, wasn't my style. Or the preaching, yeah, it wasn't quite good. Or my friends aren't there anymore. And so we change churches, which again doesn't teach anything about how to build in roots. Now I'm not saying that we should always stay in the same church because there, there are plenty of good reasons to leave, but there are also plenty of bad reasons to leave church. We also don't share a common story anymore. And that leaves us feeling abandoned and like nobody really understands us. So when they come into a church community, when you're trying to build a church community, you have to start creating right from the very beginning a common story and trying to help people start very slowly sticking roots in, testing it to see if this is going to stick. Is this, is this a good story? Is this a safe place to put my roots? Am I okay to place my roots here? Am I going to pull them up or are they going to rip my roots out? These are questions that reach to the very heart because they're all about our security and all of us want to feel secure. And so it's a, different, it's a different world trying to set up a community than it probably was even 15 to 20 years ago. The second challenge that we face is there's a lot of communities out there. I mean, I, I already listed some, family, work, school, clubs, interests, national, uh, and your citizenship, your political party, even religion. So when I think of our church, 
and the things that we're involved with, we now have a membership of about 40 people. And, and just in that small group of people, we have our church community, we have Serve the City, which is a mission organization uh, and an outreach that we're involved in. We have some of us serving on Mission Net, and, and when Mission Net doesn't happen, it happens locally or nationally. And then we have working with university students under IFES. All of those are evangelical, amazing organizations, but they compete. They compete for our time, they compete for our resources, they compete for our energy. And every single week, we have people who have to kind of throw the balls in the air and go, which one do I catch? All of these are good. And how do you build a community when you have so much really interesting competition? It's something that we're still trying to figure out and answer for. But then we have another third challenge, the whole move towards virtual communities. We have never been more able to communicate than we have right now. In fact, while I've been talking to you, my dad keeps Skyping me from Canada. I mean, that's how fast that this can be. He's, what, 10,000 kilometers away, but has access to me here. And although, you know, most of you are looking at me, um, if you were students, there's likely somebody on Facebook or somebody the, viral, the, the virtual communities are just growing and growing and growing, so although we're better connected, we're more isolated and alone than we've ever been before. We create another reality of who we are. So who I am on Facebook is not really who I am here. Who I am on Twitter, even less. And we see young people creating images that they are not, because we like that wall of isolation, and we like that wall of being um, unknown and anonymous. I am shocked, shocked by what I read from some of my Christian friends, what they put on Facebook, that I know that they would never dare say face to face. But there's a certain wall of being anonymous that the virtual community allows them to have. Then part of this virtual community is also that we have access, unlimited access, to virtual evangelical communities. So I'm a pastor, a co-pastor of a church, and I plan, we plan very carefully our whole year of, of sermons and all the activities that go in that. And every Sunday we are very deliberate on how we structure the service to get the main point across. I mean, we spend hours and days on this as you can well imagine. So imagine how frustrating it is when we have planned our year and planned our day and have, have worked on our sermon and the praise and worship and the Bible readings and the videos that we show all to get a point across. And just before a lot of our people come in and right after they leave, they've listened to two or three other sermons that day on different topics, on different issues. <laughs> maybe even on the same topic that we're going to talk about with a different conclusion. It's too much information. Even if it was all brilliant, even if it was in exactly the same line as that we were teaching every Sunday, it's too much. And they can't even use, we can't even use, I can't even use what John Piper has been telling me the last three days, let alone hearing five more sermons, throughout the week. We can take it all in, we can listen to it, but we can't use it. We need To use it, you have to digest it, you have to chew on it, it's got to soak into your body, and then you've got to figure out how to apply it. If we are listening to all of this stuff, if our congregations are listening to all this stuff, we don't have time. In other words, we are, we are getting all of this information and not applying a single thing of it. So what are we doing? That's the challenge of this virtual this virtual community. The worst part for me, especially as a mom, I have an 11-year-old and a 9-year-old, I am shocked at how much time that computer or that laptop or that tablet takes up. They start playing on it, and suddenly an hour or two is gone. They get lost in that. And I have to be fair with them, I do it too. 
I begin my day in prayer and in, in quiet time with the Lord, and then I go to my emails, and then I just think, you know, I'm gonna just, I'm just gonna quickly look on Facebook just to, just to look at that news feed, just to see, you know, if something happened, if a baby was born or whatever. An hour later, I'm like, oh my, God, how did that happen? This, this thing is sucking, sucking our time. We don't have time in the first place. We're all busy. Nobody has time. But this is so exciting, so up to date. It's competing and it's causing us to isolate ourselves. It's causing us to waste our time. It's giving us messages that we can't even take and we've got to figure it out. Now, I'm obviously not telling you all the positive sides. You guys know that there are positive sides to this. I am not anti-technology, but we got to get better controls on this. And as a, as a leader of a church and as a leader of an organization, I'm telling you, we got to get our heads around this challenge because it's a big one and it's not going to stop. It's only going to get faster, more attractive. They, they, they did a study and people my parents' age, they have an average concentration time of 40 minutes. My generation has an average concentration time of 20 minutes. My son's generation has an average concentration time of three seconds. That means if they are not receiving new stimuli every three seconds, you've lost them. That's scary. That's scary. Those are challenges. Now let's move to dangers, <laughs> because if those aren't dangerous enough, let's move on to the real scary stuff. <laughs> The real scary stuff is modernity. Modernity is a danger because it's focused on the exterior. I don't want to spend, I can't spend a whole lot of time on this. If you really want to get the, the, the meat on this and have some time, please go to the Labrie website. I put it on, on the end of your resource side. Uh, Andrew Fellows deals with this beautifully. Um, and, and so does a, a partner of his that you can also find on the Libri website. You can listen and you can download their, their, their talks for free. It's very interesting stuff. I'm just going to touch on it, but I do want to say thank you, Andrew Fellows, for helping me through this. He actually came to Portugal uh, and spoke at a conference, and it, it, it really helped clarify a lot of this stuff. So what am I talking about when we talk about modernity? Everything that can be studied is basically what we're talking about. Everything that can be defined and everything that can be deconstructed. In other words, we've lost the mystery of things, even in the church, where church has the potential to be the place where things are dynamic and spontaneous, where things are mysterious and exciting, we have it programmed. We know exactly how long that sermon will take, we know how, how many songs we're going to sing, and we've got them down pretty much to the minute. There's not much left to chance, and we like it. But that's modernism that's taking over the structure. We've lost the mystery and the mysterious. We resist, actually, the supernatural, and I'm talking even in the church. I am Baptist, so we have our own issues. And one of our issues is that if you were to tell me that you just got healed, I would say, let's slow down. <laughs> Let's go to a doctor, let's get some x-rays, let's go to an MRI. You know, we're very suspicious because we're Baptist. <laughs> We've lost the mystery. There would have been a time when actually we would have rejoiced with you. But our modernity has caused us to question the supernatural, to not allow for it unless it's got beyond our proof of science. And I'm not saying science is bad either. And I'm saying that there is a place to test and to make sure. I'm saying that we have gone overboard. We don't like just the effective, but we also like it efficient. So we get frustrated. Has anybody felt this when you're sitting in church and, uh, and you know it starts at, at 10, but somebody from the praise band doesn't get there and everybody starts yeah, looking around. We, we're efficient, you know, because it's got to start, because it's got to end. And it's got to flow. I don't want oohs and ahs and hmm and hmm in my service. I want this thing to be efficient. I want people to come in off the street and see something really well put together. So I want it effective. I want it to reach their heart, but in an efficient way. That's modernity. 
People become objects to be used instead of people made in the image of God who can only find their purpose in Jesus Christ. So instead of spending time exploring and using and practicing our spiritual gifts, we say, what can you do? How can you help me? How can we build this church together? It all becomes user-based instead of spirit-based. If modernity isn't a big enough danger, then we have almost the, the opposite, or, or at least our reaction to modernity in many cases, and that's we become inward-focused, fo what I call the fortress mentality. It's a big, bad, modern world out there, and so we will just turn into ourselves. And we create programs just for us. Oh, yes, we say they're evangelistic programs, but we won't invite anyone. <laughs> we'll invite all the other church kids that we know from other churches, and we'll have a great event of 50, but not one of them are not Christians. They're all Christians. The programs are for us. We use vocabulary that only we can understand. The world is a big, bad place, and so we have to separate ourselves from it, and we must separate our children from it. We have a terrible lack of understanding of our culture and how the Bible actually speaks into that culture. We kind of pushed the pause button on our time and our culture and said, that's enough. That's all we need to know. We don't need to know what's happening out there. We just need to study these passages and we'll be okay. The, f the third difficulty that, that we see, that we have, is when we first started this whole new approach, this whole idea of building community and body, people were very excited. It felt so real. And it was exciting to share, and it was exciting to explore together, and it was exciting to live together and share meals and the whole thing. The problem is it's difficult to sustain. It's a high-level commitment. And people, over the course of two or three years, just said, Phew, can't do this anymore. I'm used to my freedom. And this, this is just too much. There's a lack of commitment on newer members who walk into that and say, oh, I thought this was just church. <laughs> you know, Sunday, in our case, from 4 till 6 o'clock, and then I don't, I just want to leave. I've done my time. They didn't understand that we kind of wanted people to have lunch together or do all sorts of stuff together. And so we, we might get new members in or new, new people to come in because they liked the style and they liked the, the preaching, but man, when it came to commitment, they were just like, that's, that's just too much. And that's because it's completely countercultural. And, it, and, it's, and it's cultural to our own sinful nature. Our sinful nature says, don't commit to somebody else. Don't depend on somebody else and don't make them dependent on you because that, that kills your free time. That, that kills your independent choice. We see that even in our own families. And if we struggle with that, if we, if we struggle putting our own family members first, it's going to be harder when they're strangers. So those are the three dangers. So then how do we get into healthy communities or do we just say it just doesn't exist? In 2016, we, let's just throw in the towel. <laughs> Let's just do church, because let me, I'll be honest with you, doing church can be done, and it can be done well, and it can have a thousand members, but that's church event. Church community, church body is much more challenging, so how do you do it? You have to subvert modernity. You have to go around, you have to go, you can't avoid it, you actually have to blow it up. So techno-driven versus spirit-driven. So instead of being effective and efficient, which are good to the point. I'm not saying it's bad to be effective and efficient. There are certain things where efficiency is very, very good. I like that my roads have, have roundabouts and stoplights because it's effective to slow us down, but it also keeps us moving, so it's efficient and effective. I'm, I'm happy for that. That's the modern world. Good on you. But when that starts seeping into our churches, that everything, when, as we deal with people, becomes efficiency, it's scary. Dependency on technology has its place. I love that I get to use a tablet and save paper. I'm glad that I, we get to show videos in church and that we have a sound system. Technology has helped us and has taken us to places we never thought we could go. I'm glad my dad can call me from Canada because if he couldn't, I might not talk to him for weeks and months. 
but it's got its place and we have to learn how to control it in our own lives and in our church bodies. Technology has given us a new definition of the concept of perfection. Computers don't make mistakes and we like that. So we start expecting that in people as well. And we don't handle it very well when people aren't easily fixed by on-off. Data input, I give you the data input, you better give me the right data output. When you don't, we get frustrated and we don't know what to do. It's very pragmatic. What if we were driven by the Holy Spirit? What if we took out the idea of always being efficient because, I hate to break it to you, people aren't efficient. People's difficulties and their heart issues and their minds and what they need are not efficient problems. They are delicate problems. What if our services ran more according to what the Spirit says instead of a line list of things that we must accomplish in an hour time or else we've blown it? What if our dependence is completely on the Holy Spirit and not on technology? And so if we go over time, that's fine. If we go under time, that's okay. If we change the order of the service, if we sing different songs, if we just stop and actually don't preach that day, but pray together because that's what's called for. Does that not create a different kind of environment? We can depend on programs and methods if we want, if we need to, but what if we just depended on the Holy Spirit to guide us? What if we looked at all of our programs in our churches and in our organizations and actually put them to the spirit test and say, do I need that? What would happen to us if we took it all away? Who would step forward? Who would step back? How would the Holy Spirit then choose to move the dynamics of our community? Market-driven versus the fruit produced. Market-driven is when we focus on the end game, when we focus on money, the saving, the consuming, or consumerism. We think about growth and growth potential. So gar Portugal right now, if you know anything about economy, Portugal is, has a garbage rating. And you know why it has a garbage rating? Because it's based on speculation. It's not real, it's based on speculation, and that's market-driven thinking. We speculate. We imagine what could happen, and then we start programming our way around it. Everything that we do and have needs to be measured to see its potential. It's not focused on virtue, just on the bottom line. So just before I came, my husband and I went to see the movie Money Monster. Has anybody seen Money Monster? It's really not worth your time. But it, uh, it does have one good line. So the very rich guy, of course, is doing all, all these bad things, and the very poor guy is confronting him on, on bad investments. And the poor guy says to him, I, I just want you to say that you're sorry for what you've done to us poor people. You've, you, you've stolen our money. And he said, what I've done, I have done nothing illegal. He's an investment broker. He said, I've done nothing illegal. But then the poor guy says, but that doesn't make it right. That concept blows everyone's mind in today's world. The idea is, if it's legal, if it doesn't hurt anybody, it's fine. We don't think of virtue anymore. We don't think that just because it's legal, that it could at the same time be very wrong. Communities need to have, Christian communities need to have different values. We need to ask ourselves, what, what, are, the, what are the real necessities of numbers? What do numbers really mean for us? Are they that important? What do they indicate? What are we looking for? We need to look at our money and our goods differently. When we get money and goods, are they for our needs, for our benefits, or are they to be used in the kingdom of God? Do we look at everything that we earn through our salaries, through bonuses, through savings? Do we look at that as ours, or do we say we're stewards of that? It's actually all God's. And I just have to be a good steward of it. We ought to hold things very lightly, but people very tightly. If we could do that, we'd be far better off. We measure success not by the numbers of people that we have, but the quality of the fruit that's produced. A good healthy tree, to be fair, produces fruit and lots of it. So I'm not saying numbers don't show anything. They can show real health. 
But just because the fruit tree has lots of fruit, you better take one off and open it up and see how healthy it is because you could have a big produce that's all damaged inside. So we need to do both. What's the fruit? Is it healthy fruit? What, it, what kind of fruit are you producing? What's its quality? And then is it reproducing other fruit? All three things are important. And then politically driven versus dynamic and less structured. Politically driven means that everything has to be structured. You get full of bureaucracy. You have lots of programs and structure, rules and numbers and patterns. But healthy communities need to flow. You can have a healthy community and have a very large community, but it's much harder. Because the second you have a large number of people, you almost are forced back into modernity to start programming, put programming in place, or, or people fall through the cracks. When you're dealing with small churches of, of 20 to 40 people, you don't need programs. You just need to kind of go with it because it's just small enough to be able to easily work with. I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm saying one is easier than the other. Be the community, and we do that through prayer. This is the number one thing that we understand as meeting point. If we're going to build a solid community, and it's one of the hardest things that we have, and one of the first things really that we've let go is prayer. Of course we pray. We pray all the time, but not persistent. Not in your face, Lord, prayer. Not that annoying widow that went before the judge every single day to say, I want this, I want this, and until he finally said, all right, I'll give it to you because you're really annoying. <laughs> That's the kind of prayer Jesus said we need to have. So if we want healthy communities, we need to maybe get on our knees and start praying for it. Consistent perseverance, a complete dependence on God instead of programs, instead of great ideas, instead of this seminar, instead of everything. This is not going to change the world. What will change the world and our community is our dependence on God. It's vital to our ministry and our life. And if it's not, Christ has just been taken out of the center. It includes time for silence. That's really hard for lots of us. When we think prayer, we think talk. <laughs> when God thinks prayer, he thinks listen. Open to receiving the answer God has for us. When he opens and closes doors, what work we should do. Using the spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, Ephesians 4:11. Every person has a gift. Every person needs to be using those. All gifts are important. And the church needs to be more effective. The community needs to be more effective in celebrating all the gifts. Not just the pastor, not just the Sunday school teacher. All the gifts. They're all important and should be celebrated, which is the third thing. We need to learn to honor one another more. Romans 12, 10. Celebrating with one another in everything, putting other fir others first, putting the feelings and, con and concerns and the needs of others first, thinking about your brother, making a commitment to one another. Dick Keyes, who's also from Labrie, asks this question, which I think is, is key for us at Meeting Point. What does commitment mean to me, and what do I expect of others? So I know what my commitment level is. And let me tell you, I've got about 15 different commitment levels, and so do you. We're more committed to our husbands and wives than we are to most other things, let's be fair. And there are certain things where our commitment level has to be 100%. My question is, when it comes to meeting point, I know where my commitment is, but if I don't ask the rest of my community, the rest of the body, what their commitment is, I might simply assume their commitment is the same as mine, and they keep disappointing me, and they keep getting madder and madder, because they're failing in their commitment. When really, had I asked them, they might have told me, well, actually, Connie, I can only give this. And if I knew that they could only give that, and they were consistently meeting that, I actually might rejoice with them, saying, you're keeping your commitment. It's different than my commitment, but that's OK. You're being faithful to what you think you can give. Now let's work to try and all get up. Be present with people's lives. It's difficult to honor others when we aren't around in key moments of their lives. How many baby dedications do we miss because we're on vacation or when somebody's parent dies or relative dies and we're just not there because we're doing other things. There was a football match and we decided not to go. We can't honor one another if we're not there. Dick Keyes also challenges the status quo by challenging us in our own hypocrisy. 
on all of these issues. So there are things that we want and expect the church to be and to do, but we also want it all. So he reminds us that we can't have a friendly, inclusive church and at the same time have the freedom to show up or not. And not just on Sundays, but in togetherness, in moments that are key in each other's lives. We want community, but at the same time, we want to be individualistic. We want to make our own decisions. We want to see our church grow and get deeper and be more caring. Meanwhile, at the same time, we want to do our own thing at our own time and in our own way. Can't have it both ways. The last thing I want to end on is at this stage of our meeting point life, we're actually now talking about, do we even carry on with the word community? Because here's what I'm finding. Because we've so overused community for everything, including social network communities, when I'm done on Facebook, I just simply click off and I'm gone. It's very easy for me to leave my neighborhood community. I get in my car and I leave. So if I keep treating church as community, we're finding that it's very easy for people to leave. So maybe it's time to go back to what Paul used and say the body. It's hard to do any of this as a body and just leave. When I'm tired of my arm, when it hurts, when it's sore, I can't actually rip it off and just leave it behind, can I? When I break my arm, it's actually the time when I take more care of it than I've ever taken it in my life. I bandage it, I hold it close to me, and I keep it there until it's strong again. That's what we need to do as the body of Christ. Stick together. The body goes wherever I go. So it's not just stuck to this room. My body will leave this room. My body leaves the building where it meets every Sunday. But it stays together in unity in diversity.